Good call, Carl. Oh, okay. Looks like we have a couple participants. We'll give a couple minutes here. We don't wanna cut into your time too much. They're all flooding in. Tell all your friends to come to this session. We got the good coffee. <laughs> Hi, Stacey. Um, I think we'll get started here. If you're, um, looks like we have a few um, folks that have joined. And so you are in the environment and natural resources session. We have um, three presentations during this session and we're going to start with Carl Sack um, from the Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. Um, and Carl is going to present on habitat mapping in the Lake Superior National Estuarine Research Reserve. Okay, and thanks, take, Molly. Take it away. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint all set up here for everybody. Um, I'll try to keep a chat window open. So if anyone's having trouble hearing or needs me to slow down, um, please throw something in the chat and I should be able to see it. Um, and uh, yeah, so my name is Carl Sack. I am, uh, my pronouns are he or they. I'm the GIS program coordinator at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. I'm joining you today from 1854 Ojibwe Ceded Territory and from the ancestral homeland of the Dakota people. And today I'll tell you a bit about the summer internship experience that I created and supervised. Uh, in order to make some habitat maps for the Lake Superior National Estuary Research Reserve in Superior, Wisconsin. So I basically structured my talk as a, as a sort of a typical scientific presentation. Um, I hope to show, though, primarily that partnerships like the one that uh, I developed over the summer can between a public agency and educators, both at the community college and high school levels, can be useful. Um, for A, training the next generation of scientists, and B, developing important products that really further the mission of a uh, public service agency. So the work I'm describing was funded by a five-year grant from NASA's Minority University Research and Education Project, or MURA. Um, the grant was run through San Jose State University um, they created a center called the Center for Applied Atmospheric Research and Education, or CARE. And uh, when I got the job at Fond du Lac, I kind of jumped into being our, our su local sub-administrator on the grant, sub-PI on our, on our sub-award that we had um, through San Jose State. Uh, the grant money over, over the past few years has paid for a number of our GIS students to work on projects in partnership with the Fond du Lac Band of Ojibwe. Uh, which um, ha also has oversight over our, the college. And uh, the money has also funded internships at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, which have been very successful and valuable and impactful experiences for our students who have done those. So all around, it's been a positive experience. But uh, unfortunately, the grant was not renewable and it was scheduled to expire in July of 2020. Um, due to COVID, though, uh, we were in unforeseen, you know, circumstances with that, we were given a one-year no-cost extension until July 31st of uh, 2021. And to, in the spring, when we were trying to close out, start getting ready to close out the grant, I still had a pretty big pile of money and not a ton of ideas 
ton of ideas how to spend it. We've had declining enrollment as have most community colleges. Um, we have very small class sizes. Most of the GIS students that I had in 2020 and uh, early 2021 graduated in the spring. So I didn't have a, a lot of a pool of potential uh, students that I could spend this money on as summer employees. And I also didn't have a project for them at that point. I mean, we've kind of been doing stuff, some stuff with, um, with the uh, Fond du Lac Band. If you saw Emily Lachlan's presentation yesterday, that was some of the work she was doing. Um, and I sort of mentioned this issue like to a colleague. I was like, you know, I have all this money. I don't really know how to spend it. And uh, she had an interesting suggestion, which was to reach out to uh, local high school teachers and, and find uh, some promising students. And I um, it's okay, you know, I, I don't really have any idea what I'm doing, how to do that. And I don't have something to hire them for, but, um, you know, I planted a brain seed that I sort of needed to, to uh, do something cool. So I decided to start by, actually calling up my friend Deanna Erickson, who happens to be the director of the Lake Superior National Estuary and Research Reserve, or NUR, uh, or Lake Superior Reserve. It goes by all kinds of acronyms. Um, Deanna had worked with and hired some of our students in the past, and so I thought she might have some ideas for projects that they needed done that um, were kind of lying around waiting for students to come along and do it. And um, luckily I was right. So Lake Superior Reserve is a unit of the National Estuary Research Reserve System, which is administered by NOAA. It's one of two NERS uh, in the Great Lakes. The other one is in Northeast Ohio. And the Lake Superior Reserve encompasses about 16,000 acres of freshwater coastal ecosystems that are subdivided into four blocks of public land and water on the Wisconsin side of the St. Louis River estuary across from Duluth. So Deanna looped in Hannah Ramage, who is the reserve's program coordinator and, and had this assignment to somehow produce habitat maps of this 16,000 acre reserve. So NOAA, it turns out, has this mandate requiring its reserves to create detailed habitat maps of the areas that they encompass and to keep those maps updated on an every five year interval. Lake Superior Reserve at this point was 10 years old. <laughs> it's uh, founded in 2011, but there were no habitat maps yet. They didn't have the staff capacity to make them. They didn't have extra funding. No, it didn't give them any money to do it. And the maps were actually becoming pretty urgent for science because uh, global warming and invasive species are rapidly changing the coastal ecosystems that exist in the reserve. For instance, we have, um, it, there's significant areas of black ash swamp in the reserve. And as, as you may know, emerald ash borer is an exotic insect pest that is decimating ash trees is now in the Duluth Superior area. And um, those, those forests are going to die. <laughs> and so we needed to uh, start pretty much right away, uh, looking at what's there now so we can evaluate and, and monitor this change. Um, so I looked at this one, okay, great project opportunity, right? I can hire some students and spend down my grant funds, pay them, you know, a living wage to, over the summer to make these habitat maps uh, or at least start on it, right? Piece of cake. So after talking, a uh, couple, a few meetings with nurse staff, I reached out to um, Dr. Cindy Welsh at Cloquet High School. Dr. Welsh is a science teacher at Cloquet High School um, and middle school, I believe. Um, she sort of works with both middle and high school students. And for the past few years, Dr. Welsh has been having her students complete GIS research projects and story maps. And I have actually hooked up and worked with Dr. Welsh a few years ago um, having some of my students, my college students, mentor her high schoolers who are working on GIS projects. Um, and uh, Dr. Welsh, for her part, was very enthusiastic about working together again and having her students involved. And she reached out, she recommended a few students who were high performing high schoolers um, 
you know, I, I actually have a, an undergraduate degree in secondary education. I've taught at the high school level before, so it wasn't really beyond the pale for me to be working with high school students, but it was sort of new territory for me. I wasn't exactly sure um, where to go with it, but take it till you make it. I put together a very general job description and nobody batted an eye at the thought of just figuring out what we were doing as we went along because there was no structured uh, process for creating these maps. And um, that's actually kind of how I like it. I find that when I'm just as clueless as my students, that's when the best learning happens all around. So full steam ahead, I hired three interns. Emily Lockling was uh, one of my students who actually kind of uh, graduated with one degree in the spring and is finishing up some other courses this year and was uh, looking for some last hurrah of an opportunity for the summer before graduating. And then two of Dr. Welsh's students, Harmony Tracy and Grace LeBond, um, I got permission from both of them to, to use their names in this presentation. So they were um, you know, rather proud of the work they did for good reason. Uh, Emily worked with me in the spring, putting together an ArcGIS uh, field collector app for Fond du Lac resource management. Harmony is uh, a senior now and Grace is a sophomore. Um, they both produced story maps for Dr. Welsh that were, they entered into the consortium's Minnesota on the Map competition for 2021. And then they came in first and second respectively in that competition. So very impressive students already, talented um, and well qualified to advance their knowledge of GIS despite their age. And then on the reserve side of things, um, I was working with uh, Hannah, who I mentioned, the project coordinator. Um, we also worked with Brandon Krimwady, who is NOAA's geospatial coordinator for the entire Great Lakes region, happens to live in Duluth. And he provided us with the classification manual that NOAA uses and directed us where to find satellite imagery and existing classified raster data that could be useful for making these maps. Mike Kutnick uh, is with the Friends Lake Superior Reserve and uh, used to work for Esri, he's now retired, but he helped set up accounts for us with the reserve's ArcGIS online organization and troubleshoot technical issues that arose on the, the software side of things. It's really, really um, a great resource. And Deanna herself took us out into the field to show us around some of the unique habitats that we had to um, turn into polygons for future classes. So as a group, um, you know, with, in consultation with the nurse staff, we sort of decided that we had very limited time. It was about an eight week period that we would be able to work with students who had no experience in ArcGIS Pro or very limited um, and uh, you know, very limited experience or no experience with classification. So we decided to just take on one relatively small piece of the reserve but a piece that has a good variety of coastal habitats, and that's Wisconsin Point. Wisconsin Point is a barrier bar that encloses Alois Bay and ends at the Superior Entry, which is the channelized mouth of the St. Louis River. Wisconsin Point has a very rich natural history and a rich history of human habitation. It was, um, of course, it's been inhabited and used by indigenous people for thousands of years. In uh, the fur trading area, era, it was home to a Northwest Company fur post and an Ojibwe community around the post that was later ejected to make way for uh, railroad facilities, warehouses that were actually never ultimately built. Um, so it then uh, ultimately got turned into a park with a small segment at the end that is now under the control of the Lac Band of Ojibwe. Alois Bay itself, um, initially contained large wild rice beds before it was industrialized. Uh, its western shore uh, was then developed for iron ore as an iron ore port. And you can see the ore docks in the image on the, the west side here. Only one of those ore docks is, is still in use today, but it is still an industrial area uh, and a neighborhood. The neighborhoods of Alawas and Itasca and Superior um, working class communities. Today, Wisconsin Point contains a few hundred acres of spectacular old growth pine forest that I don't believe was ever logged, uh, along with some younger mixed deciduous forest, emergent marshes, coastal dune ecosystems, and, and a wide sand beach. That's really, really nice to swim on. 
So we got started with the project and the first question we had to deal with was really, what are we doing? How do we classify? How do we make a habitat map? How do we create <clears throat> classification? Neuroclassifications use vector polygons. Uh, so you know, fabrics of vector polygons. So we knew what we would ultimately be creating, which was a polygon feature class. But the question was how? There's no clear guidance on the methods that the geospatial analysis methods used from NOAA. Um, they did have a manual that described the product we were creating. But the best process guidance we got was from notes from an, the other NER unit in the Great Lakes, Old Woman Creek Reserve in Northeast Ohio. And I, you know, we got those notes, I read through them, and I had to kind of chuckle because, well, first, that reserve is about 500 acres instead of 16,000. Or, uh, for Wisconsin Point is about 2,500. Um, and the notes that they had was, you know, was written in kind of sciencey jargon, but it boiled down to, we didn't have enough time, we didn't have the technical know-how, so we took some imagery and traced lines over it. So based on that, we decided to evaluate what resources we had and, and really come up with our own brainstorming ideas for how to make the map that looked hopefully a little better than that, but really not much. We didn't also didn't have the time and, and hadn't developed the technical expertise yet to really um, dig into to the possibilities for um, high quality automation and things like that. So the key resources, uh, one key resource was NOAA's 42 page NER classification scheme description. We also uh, got a scanned paper copy of a simplified list of NER classes that correspond to the National Land Cover Datasets Coastal Change Analysis Program, or CCAP classes. And the, the, the shorter document really turned out to be particularly useful for going in the field and identifying, you know, okay, how do we, would we code this habitat? How do we code this habitat? Stuff like that. One particular problem that we ran into was that the NER classification scheme is primarily designed for a saltwater coastal environment. The Saint Lower St. Louis River is considered a freshwater estuary and a sea coast, but the marine and estuary systems in the, in the classification specify a minimum level of salinity. So the chemical, um, the water chemistry is really important. And we, so we mostly ended up classifying things as lacustrine or lake-based, even though the physical processes of Lake Superior much more resemble an uh, inland sea than a lake. So in order to apply the classification scheme, really, for, we had to go out and see what was there on the ground and then compare that knowledge to what things look like from above. We didn't have any fancy instruments, but we had some local knowledge. And there's a picture of Deanna uh, showing, showing some of the interns um, the habitats. We took a few trips out to Wisconsin Point and looked at what was there. Uh, we used some GPS units to create ground truthing points that we could later look at um, to see how, how our classifications did. And we didn't, we kind of ran out of time for the, the QAQC stage, but we did um, compare, what we did was we loaded those points into ArcGIS Pro with the imagery data sets and sort of compared what we had marked them as habitat wise with what they looked like in the imagery. Um, I also took along my drone that I have for work, and we were able to throw that up in the air and get some initial, um, you know, compare right there in the field between what things look like on the ground and what they look like from above in a, in a vertical perspective. So the next task was to identify remotely sensed data sets that we could use as a basis for the classification. And Brandon was really instrumental in pointing us in the right direction here. NOAA has uh, two fairly recent sets of high resolution aerial imagery uh, on its digital coast data download platform. So these were summer images from the 2019, uh, from 2019 from the National Geodetic Survey and fall imagery from NAEP from 2018. They flew in, in late October that year. And so we had both leaf on and leaf off orthophotos, which was useful to compare distinctions between deciduous and coniferous forest types and, um, you know, each one actually was really good for different habitat, uh, for identifying different habitats. We initially thought we'd be able to use CCAP land cover data from the site as well, but unfortunately um, CCAP, the only CCAP data available was the 30 meter resolution. And that was really 
just too low to be much use for accurately deline delineating habitat boundaries. As, as you can see here on the left, it's, you really can't do a good enough job at the scale we were working at with that 30 meter resolution. So we had to kind of toss the CCAT data. We did some experimental classifications. And as I said before, you know, um, none of these interns, well, I think Emily had maybe run an unsupervised classification for one class and the other two had no experience with running classifications. Um, I'm no expert myself, but we, um, you know, we experimented with it. And um, yeah, I'm sure there are techniques and settings we could use to really improve our efficiency and automation. But basically at this point, we were trying to get the edges, you know, capture the edges between different habitat types as, as additional reference layers that we could use for digitizing polygons on top of. So to facilitate that digitizing, I ended up creating a hosted feature class in the reserves ArcGIS online organization. And then all three interns were able to uh, were able to add that feature class to their maps in ArcGIS Pro and digitize features to it, contribute features to it. So I made sure that that layer included all of the attribute fields that are specified by the classification scheme. Um, you can see a lot of these are blank, but we, you know, we probably uh, reserve staff uh, or someone with the expertise could go in and, and uh, probably add to that to that data without even necessarily just using the map without even necessarily going back to the field or adjusting the geometries. Um, for some fields, you, you know, you can specify a list of available values in uh, ArcGIS Pro. Um, and so that helps really, uh, really customize the fields to, to the purpose. So that worked well. So what did we end up accomplishing? Over the course of about eight weeks, with zero experience among us doing anything like this before, really, the interns were able to digitize a highly detailed set of polygons covering about three quarters of the area of Wisconsin Point uh, in the reserve unit. So class boundaries were based on the finest resolution of the four level class scheme. So you have in this classification scheme, a system, subsystem, class, and subclass. And we, we digitized to the subclass level for most of the polygons. We succeeded in developing and testing a preliminary workflow for mapping habitats in the Lake Superior Reserve, and it was definitely a learning experience for all of us. Now that said, the data certainly could use quite a bit of QAQC before it goes into official service for the reserve. Uh, the interns were trained to use snapping while digitizing, but it was a learning process, and, and you can see that not all of the polygons um, are as geometrically accurate as they should be or could be. And the completeness and accuracy of the attribute fields varies as well. There's several adjacent polygons that belong to the same class that could be merged. So there's a lot of data cleanup that, that we could still do if we had the time and resources. Um, I would love to work on this more. It'd also be good to run a ground truth accuracy assessment with random sampling to see how good a result the methodology proved to be. Um, we had, we ran out. Three minutes, I'm Thank sorry. You. I got so into your talk, I forgot, I have five minutes. <laughs> okay, thanks for the, the warning. I should be able to wrap it up pretty quick. In the long run, we could probably learn how to automate more of this process with classification algorithms that uh, would let us do, you know, spend less time on labor intensive digitizing. But also, you know, once these polygons are digitized, it's a lot less work to edit them than to create them from scratch. So when you have the maps, updating them every five years should, should be a lot less labor. But I'd love to hear any ideas that you all have in the Q&A for processes that could be tried out in the future. And I was hoping to be able to report that the map we created was already in use and being built upon for other units of the reserve, but things are kind of on hold with it right now. The reserve is hiring and training additional, an additional staff member who's ultimately gonna take over leading the mapping effort. And I'm hoping to meet with them sometime in the spring and have more conversations about the possibility of us continuing this partnership with other interns. We do have, have identified other funding sources we could use for it. Um, so I think we were really successful in creating a base data set to build on and, in, and, and sort of a, you know, building these links and partnerships. Um, 
More importantly, we created a model for training the next generation of GIS professionals while contributing something vital to scientists who are monitoring landscape change. You, you know, with global warming, there's going to be a lot of ecosystem change to keep up with. The reserve has to create maps every five years. So I'm hoping that this um, keeps us going in terms of opportunities for our students. So thank you for your kind attention and I'd be happy for any questions and comments at this point. Thank you, Carl. Yep, if anybody wants to um, put questions in the Q&A or in the chat, um, I'd be happy to field those questions. Um, Carl, I don't know if you see the chat, but Stacey's, yeah, okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, did I show students any snapping or topology tools is Stacy's question. So we didn't get into using topology. I honestly need more practice with topology myself, but I, we did practice some with snapping. We did look at the snapping tools that were there. And, and you can see um, in a lot of places, they did use snapping effectively. Um, so, so these polygons down here are especially well done, I think. Um, whereas some of the ones on the on the sand on the the barrier bar are less, uh, you know, are overlapping and and need some cleanup. But even there, there's some places where they they did a pretty good job. So yes, um, they use we 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 worked with snapping tools, but it was uh, a bit um, it was a learning curve. How far out the imagery went? Um, so there's there are. This particular imagery was quite limited. In fact, the, um, here I'll show you, the DSS imagery in particular did not even cover really the whole, there's a, there's a little bit of a, a gap in the coverage of the far eastern end of, of, the, um, of the area. NAEP was better um, coverage and you can get NAEP imagery actually from USGS Earth Explorer for the entire Midwest. So uh, that the NEEP imagery had full coverage, um, but the DSS imagery that we got off of NOAA's site was not complete, quite complete coverage. Cindy, uh, Stacy says Cindy is really a rock star as far as high school mentors go. Do you have any suggestions for trying to find high school students at other high schools that might be ready for this? I'm really impressed that these high school students could jump in. They were really impressive students, I have to say. Um, both Tra uh, Harmony and Grace, who's very young, she, you know, she was uh, just coming off a of freshman year, um, were, were very, you know, very mature for their age. Were were really into it and really did a bang up job. Emily was um, also helpful, but uh, you know had other stuff going on during the summer as well. Was working on another internship at the same time, so I think spend a little less time on it. But um, yeah, do I have ideas for trying to find other high school students? I think they really need the the key to the success here was that partnership with the high school teacher. So Cindy, as as Stacy said, is a rock star. Is wonderful to work with. Um, and really uh, goes above and beyond for her students. Um, and I know there are other teachers out there um, and you know, we have the educator day. I think that's a great place to build links. Geo-mentoring is a great way to build links with, with educators at the high school level as well. And to bring in new teachers and show them the possibilities. And I think you know, Harmony gave the keynote, one of the keynote talks at educator day and I'm hoping, I, I still have to watch it because I couldn't make it to that session, but I'm hoping that that inspired some of those teachers to, to uh, be open to a similar partnership. One minute left for questions. Anybody has anything for Carl? Well, thank you, Carl. This was very interesting. Um, All right. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thanks, everybody.
Yeah, we're going to um, switch over to Connor Anderson, who is going to present on detection and monitoring of invasive Phragmites using drones and satellites. And Connor is from the University of Minnesota. Thanks, Molly. Uh, like Molly said, I'm from the University of Minnesota. I am a PhD student there in the Remote Sensing and Geospatial Analysis Lab. Uh, myself, along with the others listed on this title slide, work on a project uh, to detect and monitor an invasive species called Phragmites using both drones and satellites. Uh, most of what I'm going to be covering today is our work with drones, uh, and towards the end, I'll briefly touch on our future work with satellites. To begin, I thought I would just quickly go over what makes a species invasive. Uh, and it's defined as being any organism that's not native to the area in which it's living, and it's whose introduction causes or is likely to cause harm to the environment, the economy, or to human health. These aren't a small issue by any means. Uh, in Minnesota, it's estimated that about $3 billion is done in damage annually by these pests. And that's estimated to be about $120 billion in annual damages nationwide. The one that we work with in particular is an invasive wetland grass called Phragmites australis. Uh, it's pictured here in the background behind this tree. It was originally introduced in the 18th century and it's now widely distributed across much of the United States, including Minnesota. As you can see in the picture, it's a very tall plant. It grows to about 15 feet in height and it forms these very dense monotypic stands of vegetation. It is important to note that there is a native genotype of Phragmites in Minnesota. However, it does not exhibit the same growth characteristics, so it doesn't grow as tall and it does not form these dense monotypic stands. Since the non-native is invasive, you can imagine that it has some negative impacts, including changing hydrology, altering nutrient cycles, and ultimately leading to a loss of biodiversity in the habitat types that it invades. One of the biggest challenges that we have with controlling Phragmites is the fact that we can't treat it if we don't know where it is on the landscape. And due to the habitat types that it invades, surveying or in situ surveying is particularly difficult. Uh, wetlands themselves are notoriously challenging to survey in due to flooded conditions or inundated soils, making physical traversing of these areas very difficult and very time consuming. On top of that, as I'm sure everyone here is aware, wetlands aren't just in your backyard. Uh, many times they are in remote locations uh, with limited access. Uh, so for example, uh, the picture on the slide here is a riverine wetland system uh, in the Duluth or near Duluth in the St. Louis River estuary. And if you can see the laser pointer, there's just a single road that only gives access to a small portion of this wetland. And so there really are very few ways to efficiently try and survey these large areas for Phragmites. That's where we believe that remote sensing can be a valuable tool for Phragmites management, uh, particularly for surveying and monitoring. Uh, and this is for two reasons. First is that it gives us access to areas that are generally not easily accessible. Uh, so with unoccupied aircraft systems, also known as UAS or drones, uh, as long as the vehicle remains in visible line of sight of the remote pilot, you're able to survey areas on the size of tens to potentially hundreds of acres, depending on the platform that you're using. Uh, and then with satellite imagery, the restrictions are much less. Uh, we can get imagery over areas that are physically inaccessible to us. Uh, the second reason is that the remote sensing data that we have has a higher temporal resolution than our in-situ surveying methods, uh, especially at larger geographic scales. Uh, so for example, drones are known as a drive and fly technology. You could fly, or you could go to your target area and fly that area every single day of the week if you wanted, depending on weather. Um, and then with satellite imagery, depending on the platform that you're using, you can get repeated acquisitions over areas uh, on the order of every few weeks to every few months. And so what this means is that uh, things that used to take, you know, multiple years to survey can now be done in relatively short timescales. So we can get a, an idea of where Phragmites is on the landscape 
as well as track how it's changing um, throughout the years. And so what this means is we can use this data to drive our management practices for Phragmites as a whole. As you saw on the title slide, uh, we work on detection and monitoring using drones and satellites. However, we can't monitor known Phragmites populations until we can identify and detect it in the imagery that we have available to us. Uh, so most of our research up until this point has been focused on identifying and detecting Phragmites, uh, looking to answer the two questions that are posed on the slide. First of one, first of which being, can we identify Phragmites using three band drone imagery? So red, green, blue at smaller geographic scales. And then second, can we identify Phragmites at larger geographic scales, specifically for this project in Minnesota uh, using multispectral satellite imagery? To begin, I'll just, uh, I'll, well, I'm mostly going to be covering the drone stuff that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then at the end, I'll do the satellite imagery. So we currently have six study sites uh, in Minnesota, mostly situated in Southern and Southeastern Minnesota. Um, each of these are now shown on the slide here, uh, just going in alphabetical order. Site A is the Delano Wastewater Treatment Facility. Site B is a city park located adjacent to the Delano Wastewater Treatment Facility. Site C is a private property in the Chisago Lakes area. Site D is a private property in the Wabasha area. Site E is the Chatfield Wastewater Treatment Facility and some of its neighboring property. And then Site F is the Swan Lake Wildlife Management Area. Um, all of these, uh, we, for all of these, we collected imagery in August of 2021 using a micro drone MD4-1000 uh, UAS. Um, imagery was acquired at about 400 feet above ground level. Uh, and then we corrected the multi-frequency GNSS equipment from the US UAS with base station files from the nearest Coors station to increase the positional accuracy. Um, this was all then processed using PIX4D to create a mosaic image, what you're looking at on the screen right now, as well as a digital surface model, which was derived from the generated point cloud. To give you an idea of where the Phragmites is within each of these study areas, it's now highlighted in red. Um, each location had at least two large patches of Phragmites. Uh, you can see in site A, A and E, which are the wastewater treatment facilities, you can see their reed beds are highlighted in red. Um, there are two important things to note from this slide. First of which, you'll see that sites A, D and E the text is blue. Uh, this indicates, or the, these are the sites that we use to train our classifier. Um, and sites B, C, and F are the sites that we use to validate what we have done. Um, and then the second thing is, uh, before we created our classification workflow, uh, we created our validation data set. Uh, and so 75 validation points were randomly generated within the known Phragmites extent. Uh, and then 100 validation points were generated outside of that Phragmites extent. And then each of these points were then assessed using the UAS imagery to determine whether or not it fell on or off of Phragmites. The classification workflow that we decided to use is an object-based workflow incorporating a machine learning algorithm, specifically random forest. With any object-based workflow, the first thing that's done is creating something called image objects. Uh, so if we are going to classify the image in the center of the screen right now, uh, just using our eyes, we wouldn't look at each individual pixel and try and identify what each pixel represents. What we'd really be doing is grouping pixels together and using the size, the shape, and the color of those groups of pixels to identify features. That's exactly what object-based image analysis is where we group pixels together by a process called segmentation to get something that looks like what's on the right side of the screen. And then we allow the computer to identify those groups of pixels similarly to how we would if we were going to identify features. You can see uh, on the right, those blue polygons, those are the image objects. And you can see they clearly represent features in the image like agricultural fields, 
roadways, edges of buildings. Uh, and this type of classification generally produces better results than its pixel-based counterpart. The objects that we create contain all of the information that we use to identify Phragmites. So it includes all of our remote sensing data, including values from the red, green, blue imagery, uh, height information from a canopy height model, which is derived from the UAS digital surface model. It contains textural information. So if we think of texture in front of us, our desk is very smooth compared to something like carpet, which is going to feel rougher. We can calculate similar things in imagery based on the shadows within the image. So something like Phragmites is going to have a rougher texture based on shadowing between the leaf and the stem of an individual plant, as well as shadows being cast by neighboring plants. Um, and something like a road is going to have a smoother texture because there's minimal shadowing across the surface of the road. GLCM stands for gray level co-occurrence matrix. And I uh, don't really need to know too much about that. Uh, just GLCM contrast and homogeneity are just two different ways of measuring texture from an image. We also include two different spectral band combinations, first of which is a red-blue ratio. So it's just the normalized difference between the red and the blue bands. And then we included the visible band difference vegetation index or VDVI. This is very similar to your normalized difference vegetation index that indicates uh, plant health or greenness, um, except we don't have a near in infrared band in this case. And so VDVI is our uh, next best option. The last thing that we include is something called edge contrast. This is a algorithm that identifies edges or stark boundaries in an image layer. So for example, Phragmites is very tall uh, and most of the herbaceous wetland vegetation that surrounds it uh, is generally much shorter. And so we would expect to see a very stark contrast or a border uh, in the canopy height model between Phragmites and all other vegetation around that patch. And so this, this algorithm uh, is able to detect some of those edges. Next, uh, we take those objects with all of that information and we put it through a random forest classifier. We elected to use a random forest classifier in Python, specifically in the scikit-learn package. Um, this could be done in eCognition. However, we felt it was easier to use Python to combine training data from multiple different training sites, um, as well as just general ease of use for training and testing the classifier as a whole. So the objects go through the random forest classifier and what happens is it spits out a temporary classification for us, like what's shown here on the right, with a number of different temporary classes. We then take this temporary classification and send it back through eCognition for another object-based workflow uh, to refine the classification. So what we're doing is removing objects that are misidentified as Phragmites uh, and trying to further define the true extent of Phragmites within an image. The end result is a classified image with two cover types. Uh, Phragmites and not Phragmites. Um, we don't, or the only thing we care about in the image is where the Phragmites is. Uh, so all of the other cover types that are not Phragmites are just lumped together into a single cover type. So far, we have tested this on our three validation sites, uh, the first of which being the Delano City Park. On the left, you'll see the Phragmites that is being predicted by our classification workflow. Uh, Everything that's in bright green is Phragmites that's being correctly identified, and everything in red is vegetation that's being misidentified as Phragmites. And then everything or on the right, you'll see uh, the true extent of Phragmites within the study area as a reference. So everything in orange is where Phragmites actually exists within the study area. You'll see that we do a reasonable job uh, at capturing where the Phragmites is. We, uh, identify Phragmites in each of the known populations within the city park. However, if you look at the laser pointer, we're missing little parts of known populations and then overestimating 
around the edges of the patches, as well as misidentifying some of this herbaceous wetland vegetation um, that's within the park. But overall, it seems to do a reasonable job. This is consistent when we're looking at the Chisago Lake property. Uh, the, the overestimation uh, is a little bit less here. However, we run into the issue of not capturing some of the Phragmites uh, in certain parts of this wetland complex. Um, this is likely due to the overall size of the Phragmites that's growing here. Um, so in most locations uh, that we're using, the Phragmites is anywhere from three and a half to four meters tall. Um, however, at this property, it's a little bit different where most of the Phragmites here is well over four meters tall. Uh, and so some of these areas that are being missed are actually being misidentified as shorter trees. So specifically think of willows or sumacs, um, something that overlaps in height with Phragmites. The same trend of identifying Phragmites in each of the populations, but uh, misidentifying some objects and um, uh, missing some Phragmites is consistent once again in the Swan Lake Wildlife Management Area. Uh, some Phragmites is being missed at the bottom patch right here, and then we're misidentifying some vegetation along the left side of the study area. The vegetation that's being misidentified here is in fact small trees, so your willows and your sumacs once again overlap in height with the Phragmites and end up being misidentified. Overall, uh, our classification workflow seems to perform reasonably well. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, 75 points for, or there's 75 validation points for the Phragmites class and 100 validation points for the not Phragmites class for each of the validation sites. So 182 of the 225 validation points were correctly identified for the Phragmites class and uh, all but two of the validation points were correctly identified for the not Phragmites class. This results in a producer's accuracy of 81% for the Phragmites class, as well as a user's accuracy of 99%. Take that with a grain of salt. Um, as you saw within the figures, uh, vegetation was being misidentified as Phragmites. So that user's accuracy of 99% isn't necessarily true. Um, however, it, those misidentified objects were just not captured with the randomized points. What this means for us going forward with our, our UAS application, um, we're still actively trying to improve the classification as a whole. Uh, we want to remove some of those misidentified objects, so find a way to differentiate between some of those shorter trees and the Phragmites itself, as well as get a, a better true representation of where the Phragmites is within these areas. Um, we plan to take what we have learned here moving forward uh, and fly different study sites. So add additional study sites as well as uh, recollect imagery over the study sites we've already done um, to start looking at uh, tracking change or monitoring these Phragmites populations with this UAS imagery uh, between years. Knowing what we learned, um, from the, the UAS application, uh, we're hopeful that we're going to be able to apply a similar classification workflow to identify Phragmites at much larger geographic scales, so specifically statewide in Minnesota. Um, we, there is one challenge that we have for large-scale identification of Phragmites, uh, and that comes down to uh, canopy height models. Um, specifically, uh, we have identified canopy height models as being very important for identifying Phragmites from remote sensing data. This, it, this makes sense if you think about it, Phragmites is very tall and the height itself is a key distinguishing characteristic. Um, so it's reasonable to uh, assume that it's going to be very important at larger scales with remote sensing data. However, when we move to much larger scales, our elevation data that's available across the state 
uh, becomes limited. The, the last time we had LIDAR collected across the state of Minnesota uh, was between 2008 and 2012. Uh, and when we're trying to track a plant that changes its distribution between years, uh, using outdated canopy height models or elevation data uh, is only going to introduce errors in our classification, um, which will then render it uh, not usable by resource managers. However, there is a, another type of remote sensing data that we plan on using for our application, and that's something called commercial satellite stereo retrievals. These are satellite images that are collected in pairs with off nadir uh, viewing angles. And because of those off nadir viewing angles, you're able to recreate surface models from those pairs of imagery. Uh, some of you may are already be aware of this, but the Polar Geospatial Center at the University of Minnesota, as well as their collaborators are uh, working on a project called EarthDEM, uh, which is creating surface models of the entire globe from these commercial satellite stereo retrievals. Um, we plan to harness the data that they're creating to identify Phragmites uh, across the state of Minnesota. Um, if you look at what's shown on the screen here, uh, everything in pink is a stereo retrieval by the Digital Globe company. So they operate your Worldview 1, 2, and 3 satellites. Um, this, this isn't meant to uh, be a zoomed in view of Minnesota. This is really meant to give you an idea of how much data is actually being collected. So this is a collection log of the last nine months. Um, if, if you could zoom into Minnesota, you would see that there is a decent amount of coverage uh, in Minnesota. Um, so once again, I, I don't know if I mentioned everything in pink is a stereo acquisition. Um, so this is a, a lot of data that is going to become available at some point uh, from the Polar Geospatial Center. And so what this means for us is that uh, we can completely remove this temporal discrepancy. Uh, so it, we no longer have to worry about having a multispectral image uh, and a canopy height model from different points in time, introducing error within our classification. Uh, we can instead have this data uh, where we can have a multispectral image and a canopy height model from the same exact moment in time to identify Phragmites, um, which we're hopeful is going to work well for our application. And then in the long run, we can use this uh, to monitor Phragmites um, within each of these areas. With that, I'd just like to acknowledge our funding source. So our project is funded by the Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center. Uh, through the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Um, and with that, I will take any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Connor. Um, any questions or um, comments, just put them in the chat or the Q&A. We do have a question. Um, somebody asked, how did you choose your site locations? Yeah, so that, um, it really came down to areas that had uh, decent sized populations. Um, so there is a, there's definitely a limit to what we can detect. Uh, so areas with only a few plants aren't going to be detectable. Uh, so we had to first find locations that had uh, reasonable sized patches. And then the second thing we had to do was make sure that they were in areas that we could fly with the UAS. Um, so even with, with new rulings of being able to fly over roads, um, we, we wanted to make sure that we were in areas that were, you know, not flying over roads for the whole entire time. Um, no cell towers, no airports nearby. So it really came down to uh, limiting factors like that. Connor, uh, what was your minimum mapping unit? Maybe you said that and I just missed it. Um, I did not. It's uh, for the Phragmites, it's probably around a couple square meters would be my, would what I would, would it say. Um, anything smaller than that, um, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to detect. I mean, it's, uh, we use, a, a lot of the algorithms that we use, use a, a moving window. Um, and 
if there aren't enough plants, uh, then it just doesn't work right. Did you say what time of the year you flew the drone imagery? Uh, August of 2021. Okay. And do you think that um, if you flew it at different, maybe June or July, that probably would affect? I mean, how did you decide on August? Yeah. Um, so August corresponds with uh, when Phragmites is at its highest growth. Um, so before that, uh, the plants won't be up to their, you know, 12 to 15 feet height. Um, and then any time after that, although it, it might make it easier to identify, you know, if we flew in October, when most of the other vegetation has senesced, um, flying in, or in August is, uh, corresponds with the time right before they start to treat. Um, so the idea is to be able to identify it before they go out for treatments uh, of these patches uh, to be useful. So it, it would still be useful to identify it at later times, but uh, I think it's more applicable to be able to identify it right before they go out for treatment. I have a lot of questions, Connor. No, um, keep, keep them coming. <laughs> um, Considering the challenges with the drone imagery, you know, just like as far as where you can fly it, where you can't, how practical do you think this would be to apply, you know, more broad scale? Um, you know, I would say a couple of years ago, it would have been more difficult, but I think as uh, more people start to use drones, I think those regulations are going to change. I mean, we've already seen that with uh, now having the ability to fly over roads and the ability to fly over people. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't think it's gonna change around airports, but you can get, um, you, you can get special rulings to go and fly in areas that you normally can't. Um, so I, I don't know if it's going to be a, a restriction further down the road as more people start to use use these for other purposes. We do have a question in the Q&A. Can you say more about getting a DSM from the drone imagery? And was that in PIX4D? Yep. Uh, so yes, that was from PIX4D. Uh, during processing of the imagery, uh, PIX4D will create a point cloud. Um, and from that point cloud, uh, they will also create a digital surface model. And so we used the digital surface model that was spit out by PIX4D. So I don't know if, if I need to touch more on that because um, most, most of this, the work for creating the DSM uh, is done behind the scenes in PIX4D itself. It's not an not a active creation by us. Uh, Python tool sets that I use. Um, I'll answer that in a second. Uh, I'll answer the idea of accuracy first. Um, it, so, so we collected ground control points to use as a reference. So the, the UAS that we used is uh, enabled for post-processing kinematics, which is why we were able to correct the, the multi-frequency GNSS files uh, with the Coors base station files. Um, I can't give exact measurements because we weren't able to collect enough ground control points to give, you know, like a, a steadfast accuracy. Um, usually the X, Y accuracy over the control points was within a couple centimeters um, and the vertical accuracy was usually less than 10 centimeters. Um, the Python tool sets, uh, it was uh, scikit-learn for the random forest classifier, as well as uh, like NumPy and Pandas uh, for working with tabular data. Uh, 
the state is purchasing the DSM for NAEP 2021. Any plans to incorporate uh, NAEP in the future? Yes, um, very much looking forward to it. Uh, one of the challenges with the commercial satellite stereo retrievals um, is the fact that uh, Minnesota is pretty cloudy. Um, and so even though there are a lot of collections uh, that are happening, there are still a lot of clouds that cover um, areas that we're looking at. Uh, I think NAEP will be able to remedy that. Um, plus it's a higher resolution than the digital globe imagery um, or at least the multi-spectral imagery. Uh, so very much looking forward to it and very much going to see if we can use it. All right, it is 12 o'clock. Thank you, Connor. Um, yep. I think we'll move on to Katie's presentation. We have Katie Rossman from um, Minute at DNR and she's going to talk about public lands of Minnesota. Take it away, Katie. Thanks, let me get my screen shared here. Okay, so as Molly said, my name is Katie Rossman. I am a GIS specialist with um, I work in our Northwest region out of the Bemidji headquarters office. Um, oh, and I'm getting an auto quality warning. Can you hear me okay or am I getting choppy? You were choppy for a minute or not even a minute, maybe a few seconds, but I can hear you well now. Okay, it worked fine yesterday. I'm getting warnings today. Who knows? It's raining. That's the difference. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about uh, something that started kind of as a side project, um, but getting a uh, data set um, for the public lands across Minnesota. So one of the, the first things I want to say um, is public lands. The, the correct title. Um, just recently, we have been talking about possibly renaming this data set uh, to being something like the government owned lands of uh, Minnesota, because not all land owned by public entities is necessarily open uh, to the public. So that is right off the bat, that's something we are talking about right now. Um, we kind of, how did this come up? You know, who owns public land in Minnesota? How much is there and where is it? Um, these type of questions come up a lot, uh, especially in the DNR uh, when we are working on uh, large scale uh, conservation projects. Um, this question specifically came up um, within the DNR's strategic land asset management or SLAM program. Um, this program, uh, we use data-driven decision-making um, to help manage DNR's land portfolio through acquisitions, sales, and uh, land exchanges. Um, part of this is not knowing only where public land currently is, um, you know, land that uh, is uh, currently or could be used for conservation um, or habitat management, but also uh, where there are less uh, public lands and where we could increase conservation efforts. So historically, there hasn't really been an easy way to answer this question um, in a single data set. Uh, users would need to collect data from multiple sources, um, you know, our our state land ownership uh, data is available. Um, you need to know where federal lands are. You would have to go to uh, even the different agencies within the federal government uh, to get where their lands are, specific county, um, where their county fee and tax forfeit lands are. You have to go to all of these different sources, gather your data um, for your project. And gathering the data can, can be a time suck uh, when you're working on your project, especially if you have to 
uh, sign data agreements or things like that in the meantime. So, um, like I said, what kind of started as a, a side project for me is, um, you know, well, I can, I can smash all of, all of this information uh, into one data set or, or pull it from other sources and make one data set. So uh, DNR uh, in coordination with um, Mingeo and Minute Services, uh, we've all been working together to get one data set of all of the public or government owned lands across the state. So what were, what were my methods of putting this data together? Uh, the main data set that I used was the uh, county parcel data. So uh, this data is uh, put together by Mingeo, uh, compilation of county parcel data from all of our different, I need to get my camera thing. I'm sorry if this has been in the way this whole time. <laughs> um, compilation of the county parcel data from all 87 counties. 87 counties um, in Minnesota. Those counties share their data with Mingeo. Uh, Mingeo aggregates and standardizes it and uh, puts out a statewide uh, parcel data set available to state agencies. Unfortunately, uh, because not all counties have uh, open data policies, the statewide parcel data isn't publicly available for everybody. Um, we decided to use the parcel data um, mainly because it already has the information that we're looking for across the state. Um, it has owner information and it has the polygons. Um, instead of going to all of the different organizations and uh, trying to gather data. Um, and also part of the um, GAC parcel standards, there is an ownership category already in those standards um, with uh, domains that include, you know, federal, state, county fee, tax forfeit, municipal, um, tribal, and private. So those were the categories uh, that we decided to stick with since it already is part of a standard somewhere else. Uh, the biggest hurdle uh, with using the parcel data is that uh, we found uh, very few of any standard naming conventions throughout the parcel data. Um, of course, county to county, how they are naming their data uh, changes because it's every county's individual data set, uh, but also within the county, um, parcels owned by the same entity could be named many different things. Um, you know, for example, if we are looking at uh, state property, you know, lands owned by the state, um, it could be labeled with, you know, the abbreviation of STMN for state of Minnesota could be spelled out state of Minnesota. Um, it could be Department of Natural Resources or DNR or state forest, um, or even going back to when we were the Department of Conservation. Um, all of those different uh, naming uh, conventions were used all to talk about the same owner. Uh, so that was, that was a challenge trying to get all of those values uh, that would be the same category. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it started out with um, doing a couple of different automated Python queries. So like a, for the first sweep I did um, was searching for terms um, like national, federal, USA, uh, when looking for federal properties um, or a state or department or, you know, DPT for the abbreviation or DNR. State had many other uh, names in there as well. Um, looking for county or CO. Um, 
in the terms of city, town, village, uh, township, all those others. Um, so that was sweep number one to include all of those values. Um, and then I had to take a second sweep through and exclude uh, certain terms like bank or credit union. Um, banks specifically uh, are named lots of things like federal credit union or, you know, first state bank or, you know, the city bank. Um, so privately owned that had those initial keywords in them. So removing those uh, from the data. Um, and then lastly, I did do a manual quality control. You know, actually looking through all of the values that it pulled, checking, is that really state property um, or not? Um, looking for things that did not get included. Um, you know, especially when it came to, uh, especially uh, DNR properties where um, they labeled it as like the management unit. So it could be like the Paul Bunyan State Forest um, or a wildlife management area, um, making sure that all of those got included. When I had that part all done, I was able to uh, build some data dictionaries um, to put together uh, some Python scripts for automated updates. Um, because going through this the first time, you know, while I'm also working on other things, because this was kind of on the side, um, it did take about four months to go through this whole thing. So trying to get an automated process. So when we get new parcel data every year or a couple of years, um, we can update this public lands data set as well without having to take up a large amount of time. So why is a data set like this important other than making it easier when we're doing projects? Um, so this data would be important um, for decision and policy making. You know, if we have one uh, data standard, it would be consistent uh, landscape level information um, for prioritizing public land policy. Um, and related activities. Um, everybody's on the same playing field, looking at the same information. Um, and really looking at the uh, natural resources and the DNR um, side of things, uh, we can really do collaborative um, ecosystem and conservation planning um, where we know where the different types of public land boundaries are. Um, it adds significant value to our uh, planning initiatives. We can work with the other um, governmental units or other conservation partners uh, to try and get, you know, larger, um, maybe not blocks of land, maybe not owned by the same owner, but uh, in cooperation, keeping some of those lands and habitats uh, in conservation or managed. And for outdoor uh, recreation, um, you know, especially in Minnesota, our outdoor recreation industry um, is really big. We have so many um, recreation opportunities. You know, it's a billion dollar economy here. <laughs> um, so if the public were to know where all the different public lands are across the state, uh, finding opportunities to explore some of our hidden gems, um, you know, our special lands and waterways. Um, having all the different public land mapped out. Um, oh, yes. Um, also helps uh, the public find, um, or even uh, outdoor recreation companies, uh, find ways to access some of that land that they may not have had access to before. Um, and then also, you know, reducing conflict among uh, competing land resources. Like I mentioned before, um, being able to cooperatively uh, plan some conservation efforts, whether it be through uh, 
government owned and privately owned or intergovernmental um, ownership. Seeing those patterns um, can help uh, ensure that agencies um, are working on these projects more accurately um, and collaboratively. So who might use this data? Um, first, natural resources and conservation. This is where this uh, initial question came to me through, um, you know, especially with the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, one of the critical responsibilities uh, is investing in and managing Minnesota's public land for the future generations. Um, if we don't know where uh, public land, conservation land is, how do we plan to preserve that for the future? Um, tourism and outdoor recreation, and like I said, recreation is a billion dollar industry in the state. Um, and tourism, people come here from all across the country to see Minnesota's natural wonders. Um, you know, a lot of the public land in the state uh, is inaccessible unless you have act, uh, can gain access through private property. So if we have that all uh, mapped out, we can find um, areas where we could either get uh, agreements or acquire access to some of those hidden gems. Um, the forest industry, you know, Minnesota's uh, uh, forest supply timber products, um, of course, uh, wildlife habitat, protecting um, our water quality and watersheds, uh, have their own rep recreation opportunities, there we go. Um, and of course have their, you know, cultural benefits, taking a walk out in the woods. Excuse me, take a drink here. And then of course, we have folks like us, our collaborative uh, GIS groups. So a data set like this uh, can significantly support, um, you know, efforts such as those in the Arrowhead GIS collaborative. I know that the project attempted um, by them a few years ago um, and was kind of an inspiration for my project as well. Um, you know, having the uh, collaborative data sharing and improving the quality of uh, this type of data used by um, state agencies, county agencies, private agencies, everyone across the board. Um, if we have it, you know, all across the board, um, we can review it, ensure its accuracy, um, and share the information with the public and our partners. So our uh, next steps. So the next step, um, we, in the initial timeline, um, a lot of these next steps would have been uh, completed and the data would have been published already, but you know, pandemics happen. Um, and uh, it got, this project got push, pushed uh, further and further down on the to-do list. Um, so we would like to officially share this project um, with our partners, uh, gather feedback, concerns, ideally support uh, for this project. Um, so some of those partners would be, you know, working with the GAC. Um, I have currently been working with them um, and the Open Data Parcel Group and um, Parcel Standards, trying to uh, get that uh, movement going, open data across the state for uh, parcels. Um, sharing this with county boards, county GIS staff, auditors, land commissioners, et cetera. You know, we, uh, this is using county data. So wanting to make sure that we have support of the counties, um, especially make sure we are not missing um, values in the data that should be included or we're not including values that should be excluded uh, from the data. We wanna make sure what we're putting out there is correct. Um, 
also reaching out to uh, tribal governments. Um, you know, uh, how the tribal lands in the state are named in the parcel data um, is, is very different um, in certain counties. Um, is it um, federal for the tribe? Is it specifically the tribal government uh, name on that property? So we did have some questions on there wanting to confirm those uh, with tribal governments and again, get their support for this project. Um, and then bringing it to the GIS community uh, like you all here today. Again, um, support for this. Uh, we get all the support we need. We've uh, made any changes that are required. We would hope to um, publish this data out to uh, the public for anyone to use. Uh, some of the uh, lessons learned and obstacles uh, I've come up with in the project. Um, my update script and the uh, dictionary values did require some divisions. Um, my initial data was from 2019. I've done an update here in 2021. Um, and in about half of the counties, um, things were named slightly differently and did not get caught by um, my script. So thankfully doing some more manual um, quality checks, I was able to catch those um, and add them to the dictionary. Um, again, having a uh, the parcel standards and uh, naming conventions. You know, we, the, the GAC has their parcel standards, uh, but it has not been adopted by uh, every county's GIS data. Um, so that ownership category uh, is part of the standard, but very few, I think only a handful of the counties had it within our statewide data set. Um, in the perfect world, these categorizations um, would be done at the county level and we could query through there. Um, and again, the, the naming conventions, you know, even in the, in the two years between my uh, data sets here, things were named slightly differently. Was there a typo or an extra space or abbreviated differently? So things like that um, come up all the time. Um, another obstacle was time itself. Um, the initial project took quite a while to do. Of course, I didn't have much dedicated time to it. Um, but the uh, time in doing all of this um, outreach to different groups um, has taken quite a while. And of course, then we had a uh, pandemic um, and at DNR, we, we uh, a couple people transferred positions uh, in our outreach group. So we've been a, a little short staffed on that as well. Um, another thing I have thought have uh, you know thought of before is you know is this the best best method uh, to accomplish this project? Would it have been better to reach out to all of the different organizations, get their data, and then put it all into one data set instead of querying uh, from somewhere else? So things I'm always thinking of. Um, and I did want to share with you, we do have a story map um, on this data, but with, with a caveat that this is still uh, somewhat in, in draft. Um, I do have that up here. So the data is not, come on. The data in here right now is just an image you can actually get uh, uh, to the data, but this is just a draft of what the uh, presentation could be. And this is a shortened version of this 
um, presentation, really, different users of the data. Um, the story map was put together kind of for um, upper management uh, legislature, things like that. But you can take a look um, at the, the, the image service of the data. Um, this particular one did not include um, the tribal lands as we weren't sure how they fell into the public definition. Um, so those were just uh, queried out of this data set. Um, but from here, we were also able to do a uh, summary by county of the amount of public lands um, in the state and kind of break down uh, those different ownerships across there. Because um, one of the things that DNR um, sometimes get is, is how much land we own. Um, so looking at the, the breakdown of those different public ownerships, if we've got Cook County, um, almost 80% of the county uh, is owned by some public entity. Um, but only 14% of that is managed uh, by DNR, by the state. Um, majority of it is federally owned. So uh, clearing up some of those uh, misnomers uh, that we can sometimes come, come across. Um, but I do have some questions coming in. I've got these up already. Um, let that go here. Um, so have I done a QA, Q, QA, QC um, analysis for my identification success rate. Um, I haven't done an analysis on my success rate. I've just gone and double checked if it worked or didn't work. See, so we've got some more from Mike Dalbo. Do you think if parcel attribute standards weren't so lengthy, uh, more counties would be able to meet them? Um, possibly. I know some of the things that uh, we've talked about in our GAC committee meetings um, is that the GIS um, is pulling information from tax records. Um, and there's a few different tax record systems that different um, counties use across the state and uh, trying to merge the two together um, has been a difficulty for some counties. So shortening up the standards uh, could be possible to, to encourage more counties to meet them. I don't know. Um, and do I think reducing the detail in the public land data cell will help um, get buy-in from partners? That is, you know, stripping out um, a lot of the attributes. That is one thing that we have thought about, um, you know, conversations for when we're bringing it to, you know, counties or, or other partners here. Um, you know, since your full, full parcel uh, information isn't public, what if we um, just strip it down to, yeah, the owner and the polygon with that, uh, let you um, allow us to public, uh, Publish it publicly. There. <laughs> um, or, you know, since it already is owned by a public entity, is that okay to share the way it is? I'm here. Okay, I'm running out of time. Um, question from Bill When I was looking uh, for public lands, um, what fields was I looking in? Um, owner name, taxpayer name, combination of the fields. Um, ended up being um, a combination uh, because for some counties, their owner information is in the owner name column. For some counties, it is in the taxpayer name column. Um, for uh, a handful, they had information in both, um, but not, not always the same. I uh, did come across a few instances where um, tax forfeit lands um, were being uh, leased or had contract for deeds 
on them. So they were getting taxes on them um, and being managed as private uh, versus the official owner was still a public entity. So combination of those fields, not just one or the other. So another layer of complexity to the project. Maybe there's also some questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm just checking those. Um, yes, I can put the link to the story map um, here in the chat. If I can get back to my window. Yeah, that one. We'll just do this since I'm copying and pasting it in. Okay. Um, Adam, what the Haskell County Land Department is um, the studio database available now? Um, so, yeah, we haven't um, put anything available um, right now. Part of our next steps um, is going to be reaching out to the counties. Um, so eventually we will be reaching out to Itasca County um, and bringing this to you and of course sharing the data at that time. So we don't have it right now. Um, how did I treat undivided interest lands? Um, the best I could. Um, not all of those undivided interests were uh, um, not noticeable but obvious um, in the parcel data. Um, they just said, you know, an owner. Um, and if it was undivided, a lot of times the, the, undivided, the, the other party might not even be listed um, in there. So if I knew of any, they were addressed. Uh, if I didn't already know of them, they were not addressed for uh, undivided interest. Thank you, Katie. Um, we are at 1232, um, so we probably should wrap it up here. And yep. thank you to all of our presenters during this um, session. And we'll sign off. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye.